Hi, and welcome to this video on basic harpsichord maintenance. Today I will be walking you through the manual aspects of tuning a harpsichord. I will show you some things you need to be aware of when tuning, as well as some tips and tricks to get accurate results and my personal method of tuning a harpsichord. So, let's get started with the basics. Naturally, you will need a tuning hammer which fits the tuning pins of the instrument you wish to tune. This seems obvious, but it's really important that you have one that's neither too small, as it won't even fit on the tuning pins, nor too large, as a loose tuning hammer will make your job quite difficult. If you buy a new instrument, you will most likely receive a fitting tuning hammer from your harpsichord maker. If you buy a used instrument, the previous owner should be able to tell you the exact size of the required tuning hammer. If you're tuning an instrument belonging to an institution like a conservatory or a concert hall, it is unlikely that anyone will be able to tell you the size of the tuning pins. I have found that in the case of historical tuning pins, a tuning hammer optimised for pins with a width of 3.5 to 4 mm fits most instruments. For modern tuning pins, the width would be around 4.4 mm. If you're buying a new tuning hammer, you will find versions that are L-shaped and others that are T-shaped. Do not buy the L-shaped ones, always go for the T-shaped ones. Using these, the L-shaped ones, means running the risk of applying pressure at a bad angle to the tuning pins. This can lead to an unintentional widening of the holes in which the pins sit, which will in turn cause the tuning pins to start slipping. So, always go for the T-shaped tuning hammers. The size and material of the handle are of course a matter of personal preference. Some prefer large wooden handles, others prefer small metal handles, and you might also want to consider buying a tuning hammer with a hook at the top. Though this is slightly less comfortable when tuning, you will need this hook for making replacement strings. As you can see, I own several different tuning hammers, some with and some without a hook. The next question we need to address is whether to tune by ear or with a tuning machine. I will always recommend tuning by ear alone, with one exception. Though this means more effort and time invested in the beginning, there is really no better way to train your ear to become a very finely adjusted sensory organ. Besides, tuning devices often have great difficulties filtering out background noise. They have a hard time dealing with unstable strains. Your ear will do a much better job compensating for these issues. I have found that once you've practiced tuning by ear, the result will be much more accurate than tuning an instrument using only a tuning machine, and it will take pretty much the same amount of time. The only exception would be temperaments which are impossible to accurately tune by ear. I'm talking about those temperaments like night art, which employs such finely nuanced intervals with hardly a pure interval in between, that an accurate tuning by ear is all but impossible. This is not surprising, considering night art meant for these temperaments to be tuned with the aid of a monochord, so basically an 18th century version of a tuning device. Still, with these temperaments, I recommend tuning only the first octave by means of the tuning machine and the rest of the instrument using your ears. Finally, let's talk about your choice of pitch and temperament. These, of course, depend on how historically accurate you want your tuning to be. If you're a bit of a purist, you should consider tuning at different pitches than 450. There are a vast number of historical pitches which would warrant a separate video. As luck would have it, such a video already exists on the channel Early Music Sources. The link can be found in the description to this video. As to the specific temperament you use, there are, again, plenty of options from which to choose. In general, if you want your instrument to sound beautiful, I would advise against tuning velotti or equal temperament, as both have quite large major thirds, which will make any chord sound rather garish, and neither were much used in the 17th and 18th century. I can only recommend you learn how to tune several different temperaments by ear, such as one quarter comma mean tone, Bergmeister III, Tom Ordinaire, and Kirnberger III. 
These are all based on the same out-of-tune fifths, four of which add up to the pure major third. In my experience, this yields a temperament which is not only easy to tune, but also results in the most common keys sounding very good. In the end, of course, the choice of temperament is up to you. On a personal note though, please, please don't tune Velotti, which is a horrible sounding, anachronistic mistake. Now, let's say you've decided on a pitch and a temperament. In my case, I will be tuning one quarter comma mean tone at 400 hertz, but it doesn't matter whether you've picked something else. The principle always remains the same. First, we need to pick a note on which to start tuning. The sources give different options. Some start on C, some on F, some on octave higher, some on octave lower. Personally, I prefer starting on C3 or the C below middle C for three reasons. Changes in the tension of the strings in the tenor region have the greatest impact on the overall balance of the instrument. So tuning these and the bass strings before tuning the higher registers will result in a more stable tuning. If, conversely, you tune the higher strings before tuning the lower strings, you may find that once you're finished, the higher registers will have gone out of tune due to the change in overall balance caused by the tuning of your tenor and bass registers. It's the same reason why violinists tune their E string last. The same degree of rotation of the tuning pin will also have a greater effect on the tension of the string the higher you get. Or, put differently, the higher you get, the more exact you need to get from a mechanical perspective to get an accurate acoustical result. Or, put differently again, tuning in the lower regions will give you much more mechanical leeway, which in turn will allow you to tune more precisely. I start on C as opposed to A or F, as my go-to historic temperaments are easiest to tune from C. These either include a pure third from C to E, or a pure third from C to E can be used as an aid when tuning them. This first C I take from the tuning device, or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you can use a tuning fork. This is one detail where practicality for me trumps historical accuracy. As I regularly tune at a variety of different pitches, this would mean owning a corresponding variety of tuning forks, which ends up needlessly expensive. Tuning apps for a phone cost very little to nothing at all, however. On the same note, I strongly advise against buying dedicated tuning devices if you own a smartphone. These often are much more expensive than their phone counterparts, often costing several hundreds of euros and they are no more capable, sometimes even less capable, than what you've already got on your phone. If you use a digital tuner, make sure you set it to the right temperament and pitch. If your device is set to equal temperament, but you want to tune Werkmeister starting on C, your A will not end up at the same pitch, at the right pitch, as the relative position of C and A are different between Werkmeister and equal temperament. When placing the tuning hammer on the pins and tuning a note, there are a few things we need to observe. Firstly, avoid pivoting the tuning hammer or leaning it from side to side. This will cause the hole in which the tuning pin sits to widen, in turn loosening the tuning pin. So never, and I repeat, never pull or push on the tuning hammer. The only force you should apply is either rotational when you tune, or straight downwards when you either installed a new string or your instrument has non-threaded tuning pins like this one does. Second, make sure you're on the right string. Do this by playing the note you want to tune and then following the vibrating string with the tuning hammer. Don't touch the strings with your fingers. The oils on your skin can cause the strings to rust. Third, as a precaution, the first rotation you make on any pin should be counterclockwise, so always tune down first. This way you prevent a potentially already highly strained string from receiving even more tension, thus breaking. Fourth, when tuning a single note or two notes together, get in the habit of striking the key 
listening, striking the key again, then turning, striking the key again, listening, etc., etc., in fast succession. The sound of a harpsichord decays rather quickly, so we need to restrike it often to be able to hear the effect of the changes in tension. If you're unsure of whether a note is sharp or flat, tune down and observe whether the interval improves or not. This way you can quickly determine whether you need to take the note up or down. I've seen some people strike a key, then listen for a very long time, then, without restriking, turn the pin. Needless to say, this takes forever and doesn't yield accurate results. You can tune what you can hear. So, once I've taken the first note from the tuning device, I stop using it and use my ears instead. First, I will tune the notes in the octave above C. For this tuning, I will start with a major third from C to E. The sources often recommend tuning in octaves and fifths, as thirds and fourths can be tricky to tune accurately. But I find that this is a matter of practice, really, and once you're comfortable enough, this makes tuning much more efficient and no less accurate. Depending on what tuning you choose, you might want to start differently than I did, and in fact, your entire first octave is bound to have a quite different arrangement from the one that I am tuning. Still, to show you my process, I will now briefly show you how I continue from this point with this particular temperament. Note that I'm striking the key very, very often, and that I'm quickly alternating between listening to the interval and correcting the E. Only when I'm getting close to the pure interval do I reduce the frequency of keystrokes in order to hear the very slow beatings which an almost pure interval produces. The interval is perfectly pure once no more beating can be heard. Once I've got a pure third, which is surprisingly narrow if you're used to equal temperament, I continue with the fifths and fourths between C, G, D, A and E. Before I do that, here's another bit of information on pure intervals. In my experience, there's usually a bit of wiggle room in which intervals will be perceived as pure on a harpsichord. If you're tuning a temperament involving pure major thirds, it's advisable to tune these thirds towards the larger end of that wiggle room, as tuning them towards the lower end will make your fifths quite narrow. It helps imagining the notes as being connected by springs or rubber bands. If you widen or narrow the intervals between notes, you create tension in the springs. The trick to a good tuning is balancing out that tension. If you narrow one interval or compress one spring here, another one gets widened there. If we make a major third too narrow, this means that the fifths between that note have to be narrowed too, and if we narrow the third too much, the fifths will be too narrow to be usable. Conversely, tuning a fifth too wide will cause the resulting major thirds to be too wide to be usable. So, when tuning pure intervals, try to stick towards the larger end of the wiggle room for thirds and fourths, and towards the narrow end of the wiggle room with fifths. So, to get back to the tuning, I've got my major third, C to E. Now I need to narrow the fifths and widen the fourths between these two notes. I start with a pure fifth from C to G, and lower the G as much as possible without the fifth becoming unbearable. Then I go on with the fourth, G to D, again starting with a pure interval, then lowering the D until the fourth is as wide as it can be, while still remaining usable. Finally, I adjust the A to achieve a fifth between D and A and a fourth between A and E, the latter of which I've tuned right after the C, and which, as a reference point, I'm not changing. Whilst doing all of this, I keep comparing each resulting interval with one another to make sure they are all equally out of tune. 
If you're new to tuning, this might be tricky, as comparing fourths and fifths with one another can be difficult at first. Once I'm satisfied my fifths and fourths are all equally out of tune and yet remain usable, I need to tune the rest of my fifths. For this particular temperament, all the fifths are equally narrow, resulting in pure major thirds. So I continue my circle of fifths. As I stopped on AE, the next fifth I need is EB, or the pure major third of GB. Whilst tuning this third, I keep making sure to compare the resulting fifth EB with the fifths I tune between C and E. I continue this process tuning major thirds and double checking using fourths and fifths along the circle of fifths until I hit D sharp. For some of these notes, I need to venture outside of my reference octave. To arrive at a C sharp within my reference octave, I either need to get the A below it, which I need to get from tuning the lower octave to my A from inside the reference octave, or I can tune it above the A from the reference octave and then tune the C sharp in the reference octave to that one. This will happen with a few notes. Venturing outside the reference octave is no big deal. Just remember to transfer those to the reference octave. So, now I've arrived at D-sharp. Were I to continue the succession here, I would arrive at an A-sharp, but instead I need B-flat. To get to B-flat, I need to go down the shuttle of fifth, starting on C. A fifth below C is F, which happens to be a major third below A. So, I can tune that major third to be pure, comparing, of course, the resulting fourth CF to its neighbours. We can now move on to B-flat, which I tune in exactly the same manner as a major third below D, whilst comparing the resulting fifth F B-flat with its neighbours. Now my reference octave is finished. This took some time because I was explaining as I went along, but once you've gotten some practice, you'll be able to do this accurately within a few minutes only. It's very important to get this octave right because this is the foundation of our entire tuning. Any mistake you make here will be transferred all across the instrument, and due to the interconnected nature of fifths and thirds and fourths, Mistakes made here will require much more effort to fix than later mistakes, so make sure to check and double check this octave. If however you're satisfied, it's time to start working on getting the other octaves tuned according to this reference octave. We start with the strings in the bass because, remember, the bass strings have a greater effect on the overall balance of the instrument 
than the treble strings. Therefore, I don't go chromatically from C to B to B flat and so on and so on, but I start with the octave to C, working my way up chromatically until I land on B. The same goes for the few lowest remaining notes if your instrument extends below C2. I do the lowest possible notes first, then go up chromatically. Don't be confused by me skipping what looks like C sharp and D sharp in the bass. This particular instrument is equipped with what's known as a short G octave, a peculiarity found especially in French instruments of the 17th century. If on your instruments these keys correspond to C sharp and D sharp, you of course include them. So now we've got about half of our first register or manual in tune. We don't finish tuning this register just yet. First, we get our other 8 foot, if you have one, or upper manual, if you have one, in tune with what we've got so far. And, as you've probably guessed already, we start with the lowest note, working our way up chromatically. Once we get high enough to do so, we check our progress against the lower octave. This is a very effective way of spotting small inaccuracies you might have missed when tuning the octaves of the first register or when tuning the unisons between the first and second registers. The reason why this is so effective is this. If you tune an octave or a unison to tuning a pure interval, which, as mentioned before, has a certain amount of wiggle room while still being perceived as pure. The issue is that once we add wiggle room upon wiggle room, we eventually amass more wiggle room than our ears can handle. So let's say you tune this octave here with a small enough inaccuracy for it not to be perfectly in tune without your ear realizing. Once we add perfect unisons to these notes, we now have two slightly out of tune octaves sounding at the same time, thus increasing the inaccuracy. If we made a slight mistake in one of the unisons, too, slight enough not to be noticed, this will be added on top of these two octaves. So, checking the unisons in octaves is a highly effective means of detecting small inaccuracies which, with everything added to each other, can potentially cause major issues. If you do encounter out tune octaves when having both registers engaged, the trick is to find out where exactly the problem is. Is it one or even both of the unisons, or is it the octave, or perhaps both? We continue like this all the way to B3. Remember, we haven't tuned anything beyond this point yet. All the time checking with the lower unisons to spot any potential mistakes.
Once finished, turn off the second register or disengage the coupling mechanism and continue tuning octaves on the lower manual or the first register you tuned, ascending chromatically. Here I like to double and triple check with the thirds, fifths and fourths, so once I've got this octave, I check by comparing both the lower C and the higher C to both F and G, comparing the resulting intervals. Only when the octave, fifth and fourth each sound properly in and out of tune respectively, I proceed.
Once I finished the remainder of the first register, I re-engaged the second register or the coupling mechanism and tuned the unisons, again checking with the lower octaves. If you have a forefoot, now's the time to tune it like you would expect, starting in the bass, chromatically ascending. You can again double check using the lower octaves, but I found that tuning the forefoot with both 8 foot registers engaged yields accurate results already. If you do not have a forefoot, you're finished. So this is my method of tuning a harpsichord. To some, this might seem needlessly fussy. However, in my experience, this is the most reliable way to achieve accurate results. And I have found that more often than not, when playing on instruments that have been tuned differently, especially without all that double and triple checking with the octaves, that I needed to make lots and lots of corrections afterwards. The way I see it, an instrument is either in tune or it isn't. There is no in-between. If everything is in tune, and there's one unison that's out of tune, sorry, but the instrument is not in tune. Now, that is not to say that an instrument with a certain degree of out of tuneness is completely unusable if you're just practicing. But for a concert, for a rehearsal, for a CD recording, or for a client who pays you money for tuning their harpsichord, so basically any situation that is not your own personal individual practice session, the tuning of an instrument should, in my opinion, be as good as you can possibly get it. Even in my own practice, I get quite irritated when the instrument is out of tune even a bit. If that takes time and effort to correct, so be it. I freely admit that I'm quite demanding when it comes to tunings. In fact, I often insist on doing the tuning myself unless I know and am comfortable with the person offering to tune for me. It's difficult to make someone understand just by speaking about it how much more glorious an instrument will sound if it's perfectly in tune as opposed to just being okay. So I hope you found this video helpful in getting your tuning just right. Thank you for watching and if you have any comments or questions please leave them in the comment section down below and feel free to check out my other videos on harpsichord maintenance to find answers to other questions you might have.